sponsored by CuriosityStream. On the 24th of February, just hours after Russia invaded Ukraine, the United States White House published their first round of sanctions, saying that they will, quote, cut off more than half of Russia's high-tech imports, restricting Russia's access to vital technological inputs, atrophying its industrial base, and undercutting Russia's strategic ambitions to exert influence on the world stage. And that was a huge understatement for what happened next. As the aggression in Ukraine intensified and it became clear that citizens around the world were outraged by Russia's actions, governments and private companies one after another started piling on and ended up announcing a set of blows so hard that if they were maintained, they will almost certainly cause the complete collapse of Russia's economy on short notice and will set the country's technological progress back by decades. In this video, I'll take a look at those sanctions and their impact with a special focus on technology and in a separate full-length video, I'll break down how Russia uses technology to fight its war, from cyber attacks to damaging communication infrastructure in Ukraine. That second video will be exclusive to Nebula, and I will donate 2,000 euros from the proceeds to the Ukrainian Red Cross, so if you want to support their work and get extra content, please consider subscribing for the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle and watching the video there, with more instructions at the end of this video. You have probably heard of sanctions targeting Putin and the people close to him by now, such as the seizures of their yachts, for example. But of course, the much more pressing issues for the Russian economy were those that target their access to technological inputs and the global financial system. In terms of technology, the initial round of US sanctions fell into two groups. First, they singled out state-owned entities and military end users who were put in a complete black box. No imports for components, no software, no services, no financing, no repair manuals, nothing. They are not allowed to receive anything made by US companies or with US tech without express approval. And second, even non-military end users were still barred from key technologies such as, quote, semiconductors, telecommunication, encryption security, lasers, sensors, navigation, avionics, and maritime technologies. Other countries from the EU to Japan and South Korea all imposed similar sanctions of their own, but initially governments tried to soften the blow on their own key companies. Koreans, for example, successfully lobbied to keep smartphone exports flowing to Russia, as Samsung is the market leader in the country. Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi reportedly lobbied to keep luxury goods off the sanctions lists, and energy exports from Russia were completely untouched to avoid any disruptions, especially in Europe. But upon seeing Russia's increased brutality and the outrage of voters and consumers around the world, the tide quickly turned and even private companies such as Samsung and Prada, who had successfully avoided legally binding export sanctions previously, decided it was probably better PR to just stop their business with Russia anyway. Even many energy buyers who were afraid of PR blowbacks and further sanctions decided to just pause their purchases just in case. And as more and more companies in the supply chain pulled out, such as shipping giants Merck, FedEx and DHL, companies like carmaker Renault simply found themselves unable to operate in the country at all, and so they halted production as well. The list of tech companies pulling out is particularly devastating. It includes Boeing and Airbus, who cut off not only new sales, but also shipments of spare parts and repair support, without which experts say that some airplanes will start being unable to operate within weeks to months. It includes Amadeus and Sabre, the world's two leading airline ticket booking software companies, whose systems Russian companies like Aeroflot used to run their airlines. And it includes the foreign companies that own and lease about 515 of Russia's 980 passenger airplanes to Russian airlines, meaning that, legally speaking, more than half of the Russian fleet will have to be returned to their owners abroad before the end of the month. In the car and truck industry, it includes just about every major brand, such as Volvo and Daimler trucks, and the passenger car businesses from Volkswagen, Ford, Toyota, and Renault, which have all limited or fully shut down both sales and production 
production in the country, and as a staggering side note, 95% of car parts in Russia are imported from abroad, so without the likes of Merck, they simply have no choice but to do so. In the consumer electronics space, the list includes the likes of Apple, Samsung, Dell, and HP, which have all partially or completely suspended their business in Russia. In the enterprise space, Oracle, SAP, and Microsoft have stopped all of their new sales and are limiting support as the three largest providers of enterprise software in the world that provide everything from database management software to inventory and human resources tools. In the payment space, PayPal has completely stopped services in the country, while MasterCard, Visa, Apple Pay, and Google Pay are severely limited, and the list goes on for a very, very long time still. This means that overnight, many industries in Russia are basically just gone, disappeared, and many others, the ones that actually remain, they'll have to retool their entire tech stack from office software to payment processing software to the delivery vans that they use, everything all at once. According to Bloomberg, around 3 million people work directly for foreign companies or companies that have foreign joint ventures. These people are at high risk of losing their jobs basically overnight, and the pullout would massively hurt local businesses as well. Either because local companies are suppliers of the international businesses that are now pulling out, or because foreign companies are also starting to divest their shares in Russian joint ventures, taking their expertise and capital with them, like Mercedes from a local truck maker, Shell and BP from local energy companies, etc. Or of course, because almost every high-tech company, even in Russia, relies heavily on foreign inputs. Industrial robots from Germany, factory automation solutions, from the US and Japan. I mean, even Russian energy companies need a ton of foreign machines and software to extract and refine oil and gas. And as companies pull out one by one, it's questionable what Russian companies will be able to operate at all going forward. And next, let's talk about everyone's favorite topic, high-end chips, which Russia has been completely cut off from for everything except for consumer-grade stuff. And to put it bluntly, things are not looking great for Russia here either. First, Intel and AMD have announced that they have stopped all shipments to Russia and Belarus, which includes both server and PC chips. Full stop. That means no gaming PCs, no server capacity expansion for cloud companies, no supercomputers for the military or any other use, etc. The largest supercomputer in Russia, by the way, was built by Sparebank a couple of years ago using NVIDIA GPUs, which of course would be sanctioned as well. Second, Nokia and Ericsson have both halted sales of network equipment to Russia as well. And while Huawei and ZTE haven't made any announcements yet, they theoretically won't be allowed to ship any high-end equipment to Russia made with sanctioned tech, such as ASML machines either, unless they themselves are willing to risk further sanctions as well. The exact impact is a little hard to predict, but the best case scenario is that Russian mobile operators will have to spend billions of dollars to change their existing equipment and start buying new stuff from Chinese vendors, and the worst case scenario is that even those vendors will simply refuse to sell them anything high-end. Now, Russia is not a major direct consumer of chips. According to the Semiconductor Industry Association, the country accounted for less than 0.1% of global chip purchases because the country mostly buys ready-made electronics from abroad instead. And theoretically, for consumer use, a person could still get, say, an Intel chip in a Huawei laptop or a Qualcomm chip in a Xiaomi phone. But anything more complicated than that, and especially any custom chips that they need, say, for military use, for example, are basically off the table. I've left a link to a fantastic video from the Asianometry channel that goes into detail about Russia's semiconductor manufacturing capabilities, but the short of it is that they basically have no real capabilities. Russia's most advanced fabs can barely produce 65 nanometer chips, which is nowhere near cutting edge, and only in relatively small quantities. Their chips are primarily used for simple tasks, such as powering chip cards for payment and the country's two somewhat competent chip design companies used Taiwanese TSMC as a manufacturing partner, who has announced that, you've guessed it, they are dropping Russia too, and we also know that at least one of those two companies uses foreign software for designing their chips as well, for which there are no easy replacements. Even military drones captured in Ukraine were found to be full of foreign parts, including everything from camera sensors to motors, and while Russia has claimed to have switched over to more domestic parts, in recent years, there is no way that they've made close to a full transition yet. 
And if you were wondering if China could just shift to China for advanced chips and components and stand, the answer is not really, because even the best Chinese fabs like SMIC can only really make advanced chips with foreign machines, and if they export those to Russia and get caught, they themselves will land on sanctions lists as well, which would completely cripple them as well. So no, I don't think they can. In other words, except for random consumer items like smartphones, for example, Russia basically has as many chips as it has in its stockpiles and then it's over. They can't really get any more, at least not high-end ones. And the thing is that the Russian economy really did not prepare itself for sanctions anywhere near this severe. Sure, Russian businesses and governments were on a bit of an alert since the Crimean invasion, where they received their first round of sanctions, so they slowly started to reorient their economy and supply chains to domestic and Chinese inputs, but because Putin insisted to the last moment, and apparently even to his own government, that he will not in fact invade Ukraine, there was no reason for any sort of strategic stockpiles or major contingency plans to be built by private businesses. Sure, Putin himself strategically increased the central bank's foreign reserves to a staggering 643 billion US dollars as his war chest, but two-thirds of even that pile was basically parked abroad and simply frozen through the sanctions. Nobody, including Putin, saw this coming, and the point here is that sanctioning any one industry in isolation, such as chips or aviation or cars, would be difficult enough to deal with on its own, but would likely be survivable, especially with the help from China, but every part of the Russian economy has just received major damage and there is no way that they can pivot everything all at once. In my reading, these sanctions combined with the voluntary pullouts from all these companies as well as the supply chain disruptions that caused even more carnage, they're simply not survivable on the long term, especially when Russia is also simultaneously running out of money. We've all heard that the ruble is collapsing now, but what you might not have known is that the ruble has lost almost 80% of its value since 2008. First through the financial crisis, then after Russia's invasion of Crimea, and now its invasion of the rest of the Ukraine, and the only reason it hasn't lost more of its value is because the Russian central bank has increased its interest rate to an insane 20%. Commercial banks now offer people 21% yearly interest rates just to convince them to not take the rubles out of their banks to avoid collapses. The high interest rates then have to be passed on to businesses as well, of course, so borrowing money became insanely expensive for them. These companies can of course also not raise money on the stock exchange either because A, it's closed half the time, and B, their valuations are in a free fall. Even China has basically halted or slowed down loans to Russian entities due to fears of a Russian financial collapse affecting their banking sector. And of course, the Russian government can't bail their companies out either because two-thirds of its assets are frozen abroad and the rest is spent on a disastrous war. I couldn't find any definitive answers to when the Russian government will run out of cash, but most people on the internet that I could find seem to believe that it's somewhere in the range of a few weeks to a few months, which is insane when they just started a war. And it means that both the government and the companies are all out of cash, or at least running out of cash soon, when they need it the most. Now, the big question with all of these sanctions is time. Will the Russian economy collapse before the Ukrainian defenses are overwhelmed? Will the international businesses that moved out maintain their position over time, or will they quietly go back to doing business in Russia in the background after a few weeks, etc.? And we have no clear answers here. We see that Shell, for example, first announced that it would pull out of Russia, but then quietly bought oil anyway when the prices dropped low enough for its greed to kick in. But tech companies companies are actually in a relatively good spot to hold out. While Russia is heavily reliant on foreign tech, most foreign tech companies view Russia as a relatively minor market, making up only a few percent of their global revenues. With the entire Russian economy collapsing anyway, that share is only likely to shrink further, and with the component shortages all over the world, most tech companies can likely just find buyers for much of their Russian stock abroad. In other words, I don't expect any major 
major reversals until there is a ceasefire at least, and instead, I expect a massive brain drain to start as wealthy and educated Russians first lose their jobs and then start moving abroad. Now, many have also claimed that this situation is somehow a major opportunity for Russia to pivot away from Western technologies, and while we can already see that in action to some degree, with banks scrambling to replace Visa and MasterCard by Chinese Union Pay, for example, the world is just so globalized that many high-end industries simply cannot exist without international inputs, transitions where possible would often take years if not decades, and Russia, of course, would also hate to simply become a technological vessel of China as well, especially when China might not be willing to take on the collateral damage for supporting a Russia that has failed both in its economy and military and has very little left to give in return anyway. In other words, if these sanctions continue, there will be no economy left to support the Russian military, Russian technological progress will be thrown back by years if not decades across the board, and in just a couple of weeks or maybe months, the vultures will start circling and they will start picking off every interesting Russian asset, every interesting Russian employee, oil fields, anything that they can get their hands on and they'll start transporting that out of the country as well. I cannot believe that Putin started a war expecting any sanctions anywhere near this scale. Now, of course, the war also has technological implications on the Ukrainian side. I've made a full-length video discussing Russia's cyber warfare against Ukraine and the damage it has done to things like Ukrainian communication infrastructure, as well as what the defenders are doing to fight back, and you can watch that exclusively on Nebula. I've said it before, but I'll be donating 2,000 euros from the proceeds to the Ukrainian Red Cross, so get subscribed if you would like to support the effort and watch some bonus content, and this video joins lots of other great Nebula content, such as Real Life Lore's explainer on Russia's invasion in Georgia, Real Engineering's incredible new series called The Battle of Britain, and soon, the second season of my Nebula original series, Technorama. Nebula is a video streaming platform built and owned by creators. It provides the space and the financial resources to let us tackle topics that are too expensive, too niche, or too sensitive to talk about here on YouTube, and it also hosts all of our regular YouTube videos ad-free and without any nasty tracking. You can get access to Nebula in our bundle with Curiosity Stream for just 15 bucks for an entire year, not a month, but an entire year. And Curiosity Stream is, of course, the home for professional documentaries online. I recently finished watching this, which was a fascinating look at how the world's first published computer program and a plan for a computer made of cogs and wheels was born in 1843 by Countess Ada Lovelace. I think my audience would enjoy watching that quite a bit as well. And Curiosity Stream is full of other great documentaries, spending history, nature, science, and more. Get access to both services with the link in the description, and I'll see you in the next one.